Now in Galatians chapter 1, of course, we have the passage that warns about those who would come preaching another gospel. And the Bible reads in verse number 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now notice that this other gospel is contrasted with the grace of Christ. You see, the true gospel has to do with salvation through the grace of Christ. It's salvation by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible says in verse 7, which is not another, saying it's not a completely different gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it contains elements of the gospel of Christ, but it's been twisted, it's been perverted. It says in verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, this is very strongly warning against those who would bring another gospel. He repeats himself for emphasis, and he's so clear on this. He says, look, even if it's we who bring another gospel, even if I come and tell you, hey, I changed my mind, it's another gospel. Don't even listen to me, he says. There is no other gospel. There's one gospel. There's one way to be saved. It's through the grace of Jesus Christ. And he says, if an angel from heaven shows up, with another gospel. He says, anybody who preaches that gospel, any angel who comes preaching, let him be accursed. You see, there are fallen angels. There are false teachers who are inspired by these evil fallen angels or demons, what we would call them. And both Muhammad and Joseph Smith fall into that category. Yeah. And I believe that this, pro this prophecy here in Galatians 1 is prophetic of both Muhammad and Joseph Smith, who claim to get these revelations from an angel that contain another gospel. Yeah. Now, the title of my sermon tonight is Islam in Light of the Bible. Yeah. I did a sermon on Hinduism in Light of the Bible, Buddhism in Light of the Bible, and uh, while covering these Eastern religions, I want to also cover Islam in Light of the Bible. Now, let me just start out by right away showing you that Islam teaches another gospel. This book right here is the Quran. This is the holy book of Islam, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But just right away, you don't have to get very far in this book before you find another gospel. You just go a few pages in. In fact, in this edition, it's on page two. Now, let me just tell you what the word gospel means according to the Bible. The Bible says, in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That is a quote of Isaiah 61 where it says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach glad tidings to the meek. And all throughout the Bible, you'll find the terms gospel and glad tidings interchange. And we would say in our modern vernacular, good news. So the glad tidings or the good news, that's the gospel. And let me tell you something. Salvation through the grace of Jesus Christ is good news. Amen. And uh, I mean, Jesus paid it all. Salvation's a free gift that's just attained by faith alone, not of any works of righteousness which we have done. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible talks about the gospel. It says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So we're saved by the gospel. It says, If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This gospel of the grace of Christ is that salvation is by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. Amen. Not by earning our way to heaven or keeping the commandments. The whole book of Galatians nails that down, yeah. that it's not the works of the law or obedience to the law that save us, but the hearing of faith and the belief in our heart that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. But right at the very beginning of this book, you don't have to get very far, page two right here. Now, the way that this book is broken up is in chapters or surahs, as they're called. So this is surah number two, and this is around verse 25. It says, and proclaim joyful tidings. Does that sound like glad tidings to you? Yeah. 
So this is their gospel. And proclaim joyful tidings to those that believe and do good works. They shall dwell in gardens watered by running brooks. Whenever they are given fruit to eat, they will say, this is what we used to eat before. For they shall be given the like. Wedded to chaste spouses, they shall abide therein forever. So here, the promise of paradise and the virgins in heaven and everything like that is given to those who believe and do good works. Now, the gospel of the grace of Christ is that salvation is by faith, not of works. Amen. Lest any man should boast. And no man can boast before God and say, oh, I'm going to heaven because I have faith and works. No, the Bible teaches that salvation is by faith alone. Amen. But to him that worketh not, Amen. but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, yeah. saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Islam has another gospel that says, believe and do good works. Now, not only that, but if you read through this book over and over again, that phrase, believe and do good works, believe and do good works, believe in, it's used scores of times in this book. Just, oh, believe and do works, believe and do the works, believe and do the works. Not only that, but in this book, hell is mentioned on almost every page of this book. Every, it's like, you're going to the fire, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, like almost every page. And it's always, hey, if you don't follow this, you're going to hell. You don't do this, you're going to hell. It'll say, hey, if you don't believe, you're going to hell, but also just other stuff. You don't do this, you don't do this, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. So it's not salvation just by believing in Jesus at all. No, it's following the commandments, obeying, it's believing and doing good works that saves you according to the Quran. It's not enough just to believe. They have five pillars of works that they do, praying five times a day, you know, making the pilgrimage to Mecca, to bow down to the GameCube there, and all the other different things that they do to earn salvation. It's another gospel, my friend. Now listen to, well, before I get into some of the, the false doctrines that are taught in the Quran, let me just give you just a basic understanding of where the Quran came from and who Muhammad is. Okay, Muhammad is a prophet who lived approximately, you know, 13, 1400 years ago, okay? So this is six, seven hundred years after the time of Christ that this religion was founded. And Muhammad was a guy who lived in Arabia. He was illiterate. He could not read or write. And when he was 40 years old, he started to reveal the Quran. Now, what happened was he would go out to a cave and he would pray and meditate there. And the angel Gabriel supposedly appeared unto him and came to him and grabbed hold of him and said, recite. And he said, I am not a reciter. And he just like squeezed him so hard that he just could almost not take it anymore. I, you know, I don't know if it was a bear hug, some th counts I read, other ones it was more like grabbing him by the throat, but just clutching him. So then, then he released him and says again, recite. Says, I'm not a reciter. You know, grabs him and does the same thing to him three times. And then after the third time, you know, puts all these words in his mouth and says, hey, you're going to be the messenger of God. You're going to bring this message of, of the word of God and so forth. So then he recites the things that are given to him supposedly by God through this angel Gabriel. Now, at the time, he said that he thought that he might have been demon possessed. He, he was, that, that was his first concern. He was worried that he was, you know, possessed of, of a devil. But then he started to realize, no, no, you know, this is the word of God. And he, he got these confirmations that it was actually God's word and that this really was the angel Gabriel. So what the Quran is, it's the oral sayings of Muhammad because basically he would keep adding to it and just he had it all memorized in his mind because he, he's not a guy who, who reads and writes. So it's all just in his mind. So he would tell people, hey, I've got another chapter of the Quran. And then he would speak it unto them. And then they would learn it by heart. And then people also did write it down and, and pass it around and circulate it. But it was, it was just something that he had in his mind. And even today, uh, many Muslims will memorize the entire Quran. It's not as long as the Bible. But they'll, they'll memorize the whole Quran and they'll recite it. They'll sing it 
as a way to remember the whole thing. So that's how it was transmitted, these different chapters. And Muslims believe that the greatest evidence for the fact that Muhammad was a true prophet is the Quran itself. You know, much as we would point to the Bible and say, well, the Bible is the evidence. Look at this magnificent book, the Bible. Except here's the thing. This is not a magnificent book at all. Right. I mean, you'd only have to read a few pages of this to realize how inferior it is to the Word of God. You know, I, I, the, just from looking into this book, what Tex Mars said at the end of Marching to Zion is the truest words ever spoken. When he said, hey, if people read the Quran and they read the Talmud and then they read the New Testament, they must come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Because of the fact that there is no comparison between this book and this book. There's no comparison. I mean, the quality of this book is just simply much lower. It's clearly a man-made concoction. Yeah. So if this is the biggest evidence they got, I'm not impressed. But let's look at some of the false doctrines that are found in this most holy book of Islam, the book that is the foundation for what they believe. And they believe that this is the very word of God, that it trumps the Bible, that it trumps anything. This is the final authority. Just some of the false doctrine, besides the fact that it teaches another gospel, right at the very beginning of the book, just a few pages in, listen to this from chapter 2, verse 34. It says, And when we said to the angels, Prostrate yourselves before Adam, they all prostrated themselves except Satan, who in his pride refused and became an unbeliever. So here, the sin of Satan is, is not to bow down and worship Adam. Now, where in the world does the Bible ever teach that anyone should have ever worshipped Adam or that any angels were commanded to bow down and worship Adam? That is a strange, false doctrine because the Bible says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And isn't it amazing that the Muslims will try to criticize us for worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, and that, while they're teaching the worship of Adam and that that was Satan's sin, not worshiping Adam? Now, this is another similarity with Mormonism because the, the prophet Brigham Young, the second prophet of Mormonism, he stated that Adam was God. Wow. Now, the Mormons don't believe that anymore, but that's what Brigham Young taught that Adam was God, which is a bizarre, strange doctrine. And it's the same thing that's being taught here. Uh, well, it's not the same thing, but it's a similar thing that's being taught here in the Quran. Why in the world would anyone be told, hey, you need to worship Adam, you need to bow down to Adam? It doesn't make any sense. Not only that, but it's interesting that in chapter 2, verse 54 here, it says, we gave Moses the book and salvation so that you might be rightly guided. So all throughout this book, it claims that the books of Moses are the word of God. In fact, it affirms both Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus. But yet the teachings of this book dramatically contradict the teachings of the law of Moses and Jesus all throughout. But yet the book claims to be a continuation of the same thing. Listen to another passage where it claims to affirm the Bible. In chapter 2, verse 97, it says, Gabriel, who has by God's grace revealed to you the Quran as a guide and joyful tidings for the faithful, confirming previous scriptures. Do you hear that? Scriptures means writings. Confirming previous scriptures. It says in 287, uh, to Moses we gave the book. And after him, we sent other apostles. We gave Jesus, the son of Mary. So over and over again, uh, verse 91, if they're told, believe in what God has revealed, they reply, we believe in what was revealed to us and they deny what has been since revealed, although it is the truth, corroborating their own scriptures. So according to the Quran, this is supposed to corroborate this. This is a continuation of this, supposedly. This is not going to contradict this. And yet it contradicts it in almost all of its teachings. Right. Let me give you some examples. Go, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Let's see if this is a confirmation and a corroboration of what was given in the Bible. And we're only looking, to, we're, we're only going to scratch the surface tonight of just the very beginning of this book and see all the false doctrine and all the things where it contradicts the, the Bible, the Word of God. I'm going to read for you from the Quran here and show you how it contradicts what the Word of God teaches. In verse 30 
of this. By the way, we're, we're in chapter two of this book the whole time. Chapter one is just a short introduction. Chapter two is called The Cow. So the, everything I'm giving you is from the chapter in the Quran that's known as The Cow. You know, which is really the first main chapter because the, the chapter one is just like a little intro. So chapter two is a big long chapter. It's called the cow. That's where this is all coming from. It's all coming from the cow, folks. All right, so chapter, ch chapter two. I lost my place in this thing. Let me find it. You're going to Deuteronomy 24. No, chapter three is not because... You know, they don't do pork, so <laughs> they don't. So, All right, here we go. So in verse 230 of the cow chapter, it says, listen to this. It's, a, it's talking about divorce and things like that. It says, when you have renounced your wives and they have reached the end of their waiting period, do not prevent from remarrying their husbands if they have come to an honorable agreement, okay? Now listen to this from verse 230. If a man divorces his wife, he shall not remarry her until she has wedded another man and been divorced by him. Wow. Wow. Did you hear that? Let me read that for you again. I want you to let this sink in. First of all, Islam, of course, is okay with polygamy, you know, multiple wives. And it's okay with divorce. And it says here, if a man divorces his wife, he shall not remarry her until she has wedded another man and been divorced by him. Now, that is not what the Bible teaches at all. Now, here's from the law of Moses that supposedly this is confirming in Deuteronomy 24. Look down at your Bible. When a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So what's the Bible teaching? The Bible is teaching that it is permissible to divorce your wife only if you find some uncleanness in her. This is what Jesus said when he said that no man can put away his wife except it be for fornication. Okay? And notice, he's not saying except it be for adultery. He said, except it be for fornication. Fornication is that which takes place before you are married. Adultery is that which could take place after you are married if you break those marriage vows. You see, what the Bible's teaching is that in the Old Testament, I don't have time to show you all this because it's not the topic of the sermon, but back in Deuteronomy 22, this is also covered, where it talks about a man who believes that he is marrying a virgin and then he goes in on her and finds her not to be a maid. At that point, he is allowed to put her away and write her a bill of divorcement, and she may be married to another man. This isn't talking about people who've been married for years, they're not compatible, or somebody's unfaithful. The Bible doesn't permit that, okay? The Bible says that the Lord God of Israel hateth putting away. And he told the Pharisees, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And if it's done for any reason other than fornication, you're causing her to commit adultery. And if you marry her that's divorced, you're committing adultery, he says. Because at that time, they were divorcing their wives for every cause. Just divorcing their wives because they want to. And Jesus said, no, that's not what it was intended for. It was if he finds uncleanness. Look, uncleanness, it doesn't mean she didn't take a bath or something. You know, uncleanness throughout the Bible is referring to sin. And it's referring to, you know, sexual sin. It's, it calls that uncleanness, whether it be fornication, whatever. So it's saying he goes in unto her and she finds no favor in his eyes because he finds uncleanness in her. Then he writes her a bill of divorcement and she may be married to another man. So before the consummation is made, that is said, hey, wait a minute, I, you know, I'm backing out of this. That's what the Bible teaches. But what it does clearly teach is that if a man divorces his wife, that if she goes and marries somebody else, that he can never be remarried to her again once he divorces her and she's with someone else. Yeah. 
Okay, so how would this play out in our modern culture? Well, today we have people getting divorced all the time, don't we? And the Bible teaches that if a man and woman get divorced, first of all, it teaches that they should get reconciled. If neither of them gets remarried, the best thing is that they are reconciled. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her be reconciled unto her husband. Okay, so the Bible teaches that ideally, if a couple splits up or divorces, the best thing that could happen is for them to be reconciled, for them to be brought back together, for them to get remarried. And I've seen it happen where people get married, then they get divorced. Then later, through getting in church, hearing the preaching of God's word, they understand the sin of being divorced. And they say, wait a minute, we need to be reconciled. We need to get back together. And, and they're remarried. And that's a blessed thing. Okay, but the Bible's real clear that once either divorced party marries someone else, that no, she may not come back and be the wife of her previous husband. The Bible says that's an abomination. Yeah. So therefore, if people are divorced and neither of them is remarried, then the hope is there for them to be reconciled. And that would be God's perfect will in that situation. But if one of them gets remarried, that can never happen. Now, what's the Quran? The Quran is bizarrely teaching that, well, if they get divorced, then they can't get back together unless she marries somebody else and gets divorced from him. Now they can get back. What in the world? Right. Well, uh, let me marry somebody else real quick. Get this out of the way. Get divorced and now come back. It's the opposite. Right. Yeah. How can this be a confirmation of the law of Moses? when it teaches the opposite. But here's what the Muslims will conveniently do. Anytime you point out one of these hundreds of contradictions between the Quran and the words of Moses, or the Quran and the words of Jesus, here's what they'll say. Oh, well, you know, that's just been corrupt. That's been tampered with. So he sits there and says in the Quran, oh, this is confirming previous script. This is confirming the law of Moses. He wants to ride on the coattails of Moses and Jesus. He wants to steal followers away from Moses and Jesus. And when, when Muslims try to evangelize you, that's what they'll always do. Oh, we love Jesus too. Right. Let me tell you about Jesus in the Quran. And oh, we believe in Jesus too. We believe in the Old Testament too. We believe in Moses too. But then when you pin them down on any of the teachings, it's all corrupt according to them. And you can point to any of hundreds of, and they'll always say, oh, it's corrupt. Everything's corrupted. Old Testament's corrupt. New Testament. The only thing we can trust is the Quran. So it claims to follow Moses and Jesus, but then discards all the teachings of Moses and Jesus and just says, oh, it's all corrupted. It's all been changed. It's all been twisted. Look, what, somebody just went back and changed Deuteronomy to say the opposite? It used to say what, what, what Muhammad said, that you got to marry somebody else and get divorced again in between before you can get reconciled again. No, because any logical person can look at what Moses says and say, hey, that makes sense. And look at what the Quran says here and say, that doesn't make any sense. And it's pretty clear which one is the corruption here and which one's right. So there's a direct contradiction. Not only that, but this book, in the same section where it talks about divorce, I'm going to jump forward in the book to a, a section that's all about divorce later on here. This book actually teaches pedophilia is okay in this book, the Quran, this holy book of Islam. Um, now, first of all, let me just bring to your attention while I'm turning there, let me bring to your attention the fact that Muhammad himself was first married to a woman named Khadijah that he was married to for many years, and she was a woman that was 15 years older than him, okay? But then he ended up marrying his next wife, okay? He, well, he married a couple wives. First, he was just married to the one for a long, they had a long marriage with her, but after she died, he decided to take another wife or two or more. So he, the wife that God supposedly told him that God supposedly came to him in a vision and told him, you need to marry this girl and she's a six-year-old. Aisha. Okay, keep in mind, this is a man in his 50s. Okay, and, and supposedly the angel of the Lord's coming to him in a dream. Look, you were right the first time, Mohammed. You got demon possessed in the cave. You should have gone with your gut on that. Okay? So the, here's an angel that's coming to him telling him, you're going to marry a six-year-old. So he's kind of embarrassed to tell anybody. 
That doesn't really surprise me that he's embarrassed to tell people that he wants to marry a six-year-old, okay? So then, you know, basically, the lady who's cleaning his house says to him, hey, Muhammad, you should marry another wife now that, you know, Khadijah is gone. And he says, well, who should I marry? And she says, either this woman, and she named another woman, or this uh, six-year-old, Aisha, one of those two. He says, I'll do both, okay? Now, he ended up, you know, I mean, she's only six, right? So he waited till she was nine to actually marry her and consummate the marriage at age nine. That is filthy. That is disgusting. That is perverted. That is pedophilia. So I thought to myself, well, you know, Muhammad was clearly a pedophile. So, you know, there's probably going to be something about that in the Quran. I literally just opened the Quran and looked at the table of contents and I saw... There was a section on divorce, and I figured, oh, that might be interesting. So I went and looked at that section on divorce, and it talks about divorcing your wife, and it talks about how there's a waiting period. You know, you got to have a three-month cool-down period, sort of like California and other states have a cool-down period for getting divorced. So there's a three-month cool-down, but it's, it's, it's three of a woman's cycles. That's the cool-down. So he says, well, you know, what if your wife's older and she's no longer, you know, as the Bible says, it ceaseth to be with her after the manner of women, to use the Bible's euphemism. Then he says, well, just go with three calendar months. Or, listen to this, the same shall apply to those who've not yet menstruated. Why are you married to a wife that has not yet? I mean, this is the perversion that's taught. And then there's a footnote at the bottom of the page that says, on account of their young age. Child marriages were common. Yeah, amongst perverts, yeah. they were common. Yeah. I don't care how common that was in Arabia amongst a bunch of pagans and perverts. Look, all Muhammad did was grow up in a wicked place in Arabia where a bunch of pagans were worshiping idols and false gods. And, you know, he just came up with a new religion that said, oh, there's only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. That's what they came up. But he, he retained a whole bunch of this pagan garbage and a bunch of perverted things just because people around him supposedly condoned that, even if, even if that's even true. That's just what Muslims will claim that, oh, people back then condoned it. Well, then they were a bunch of perverts. Right. Because that's disgusting, and it is wicked, and it is not something that the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible contradicts this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible has all the answers, and the Bible condemns pedophilia. And in this book, it says, you know, hey, if they haven't yet had their cycles, you know, here, here's how you divorce them. You know, that's weird that you're even married to somebody who hasn't had their cycles yet. That is a false doctrine. Okay. Now, look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. The Bible says, but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncovably toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. So you see how the Bible stipulates here that before they get married, that a girl must pass the flower of her age. Now, the Bible actually defines that clearly. You don't have to turn there, but back in Leviticus 15, that term flowers is used to describe the manner of women. It says, for example, in Leviticus 15, 24, and if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. And if her that is sick of her flowers, and it talks about that being an issue of blood coming forth, being good. Because think about the word, we think of a flower as something that grows outside on a plant. But also, we're, we're looking at an older language here. Think about something flowing, F-L-O-W, okay? That is what this is saying. And it says that she has to pass the flower of her age, and that is a reference to the fact that she has to be of age, physically mature as a woman and actually able to conceive seed before she can get married. And so this thing of, oh, six-year-old, nine-year-old, no, it's for pedophiles. And it's not something that's ever been no common amongst normal people. Only amongst wicked reprobates yeah. has that ever been thought of. Because listen to me, that is just as perverse as any of the other perverted things the Bible lists. 
the sodomy, the, 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 the beasts, the, all of it. It's all wicked and disgusting, and it's something that only someone who's been given over to vile affections would desire. A normal man would desire a woman, not a child. It's, it's filthy. This book condones it. He lived it in his own life. And look, I've brought this up. I'm being accurate here. I've got the Quran sitting on the pulpit, folks. I'm not making this up. Come look at it after the service. And not only that, but I've gone out soul winning and knocked the doors of hundreds of Muslims, and I've brought these things up to them. I've said, hey, what about Aisha? This and that. And they'll confirm to me every single time, yup, they got married, she was nine, and they, their only answer is just, that was normal back then. Yeah, on what planet? Yeah. <laughs> but that's their only answer, folks. And you try to show them these contradictions, and their only answer is, well, the Bible's corrupted there. I'll go with the Quran. What else? Go to, uh, go to Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53. The Quran continues further to teach another gospel. Listen to this from chapter 2, verse 122. The Quran says, and he's talking about the judgment day. Guard yourselves against a day on which no soul shall stand in for another, when no ransom shall be accepted from it, no intercession avail it, no help be given it. So according to the Quran on judgment day, there's going to be no stand in, no substitute, no intercession, and no ransom at all. Well, let's see what the Bible teaches. Look at Isaiah 53 verse 12. This is talking about Jesus. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus made intercession for the transgressors. He said in verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus is our substitute. Yeah. God laid on Jesus according to Old and New Testament. God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. And he was bruised for our iniquities. And he died for our sins. And the Bible clearly says that he made intercession for us. Listen to these scriptures from the New Testament. You can flip over to Hosea chapter 13 in the Old Testament. Listen to these scriptures from the New Testament. Matthew 20 verse 28. Even as the Son of Man, talking about Jesus, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 6 that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus is our ransom. Jesus is our substitute. Jesus is our intercessor. The only way for us to be saved is through Jesus. Because if we were to be judged for our own works, we'd be condemned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption that Muslims do not have. They don't have an intercessor. They don't have a stand-in on Judgment Day. They don't have a ransom for their soul. We have Jesus as our Savior who has died for our sin. Look, they will die in their sins and be judged for their sins. See, according to the Quran, hey, they'll be saved if they obey and follow the Quran and do works and everything like that. But here's the thing. Every single Muslim comes short. Every Muslim is a major sinner, just like every Christian's a major sinner. We've all sinned and come short. There's none righteous, no, not one. Look at Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. This is a scripture that's quoted in 1 Corinthians 15 about the gospel of Jesus, about the fact that Jesus has ransomed us from the power of the grave. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And the Bible, I'll start reading it while you're on your way there. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were not, were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. We don't need you to change it, Muhammad. Yeah. 
Jesus has an unchangeable priesthood. It's done. It's finished. The New Testament, he said, behold, I come quickly. He didn't say, behold, I'm sending another guy 600 years from now that's going to change everything. He said, no, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus is coming. Yeah. That's who we're looking for. We're not looking for some guy who came to Arabia, you know, 600 and some years later and wants to change it. Oh, everything's corrupt. Let me change everything. Because Gabriel's talking to me in the cave. It's false. Let him be accursed. Amen. And they're constantly blessing Muhammad all the time. Constantly, every time, they cannot say his name without saying, peace be upon him. Peace be, no, piss be upon him. Amen. Because you know what? <laughs> Muhammad, the Bible says, let him be accursed. Amen. Let him be accursed. Yeah. Not, there's no blessings upon Muhammad. The Bible says, if any man preaches any other gospel than that which we have received, let him be accursed. Amen. Say, well, you know, you shouldn't say that because you're going you're gonna to anger Muslims. You know what? Let him be accursed. Yeah, right. Like it or lump it. And my goal is not to anger or offend Muslims. My goal is that Muslims will be saved. You know, I want to reach Muslims with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know what? I'm not going to sit here and be respectful toward a false prophet. If that's what it takes to win Muslims, then I'm not going to win any Muslims to the Lord because the Bible commanded me to let him be accursed. Right. And you know what? I don't respect all religions. Because when Cain brought an offering unto the Lord, other than that which was the blood of the lamb, when he brought those fruits and vegetables, the Bible says that God did not have respect unto his offering. Right. God did not respect Cain's religion. And woe unto these false prophets, the Bible says, for they've gone in the way of Cain. Yeah. So if God didn't respect Cain, why would I respect those who've gone in the way of Cain? Yeah. Cain is one who brought forth work salvation. Abel brought the blood of the lamb. Amen. And you know what? The Bible says, why did Cain kill Abel? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. And let me tell you something. The spiritual Cains of Islam, they will kill unbelievers of their religion. And that's in the Quran too. We'll get there. It's there. But we're reading there in Hebrews chapter 7. It's unchangeable. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's where our salvation comes from, that Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. This says, hey, there's no intercessor. It's all on your own merits. You're doomed. Even if you believe in this, you're doomed. Because I, I remember I talked to a Muslim and she said, oh, I'm going to heaven because I, you know, she lists it off. She, she does the five pillars and she obeys the Quran. And I just, I just started pointing out to her. You know, and I don't, I don't go around pointing out people's sins to them, of course. That's not the right attitude. But because she sat there and is telling me, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. I'm, I'm going to heaven because I'm following all. I said, okay. I said, what about the TV that's right behind you that's playing the Jerry Springer show? Is that what God wants you to watch? Is that a righteous TV show? Is that of God? Oh, well, yeah, I guess not. I said, why are you in a pair of short shorts? Is that what the Quran taught you? Is that what Muhammad wants you to wear? Oh, well, you know. Where's your headscarf? Oh, uh, you yeah. know. I'm like, what's going on? I said, you're going to hell according to the Quran. You're going to hell. And I said, you're going to hell according to the Bible because you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I was trying to bring her good news that God will save her just as she is. You know, the, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. Amen. That's the salvation that Christianity offers. Amen. Islam offers, you know, prostrating yourself five times a day, making a trip to Mecca, following a bunch of rules. And you know what? You just, you hope for the best because God's gracious and compassionate. You hope that you, you make it in because he's going to overlook all of your constant mess ups, right. your constant sin. Go to 1 Peter 2. And look, we're only, we're only looking at one chapter of this book. This, this book has 114 chapters in it. You know how many we're looking at right now? One, the cow. We're still on the cow, folks. Everything we're looking at is from the cow. That's all we're, I mean, it's one chapter. It's filled with heresy. One chapter. It doesn't confirm these scriptures at all like it claims to. Listen to what 
listen to what the Quran says in Cal, Cal verse 91. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 91. Slay them wherever you find them. Slay means kill. Slay them wherever you find them. Drive them out of the places from which they drove you. Idolatry is more grievous than bloodshed. But do not fight them within the precincts of the holy mosque. Unless they attack you there. If they attack you, slay them. <laughs> Thus shall the unbelievers be requited. But if they desist, God is forgiving and compassionate. Fight them until idolatry is no more and God's religion reigns supreme. But if they desist, attack none except the wrongdoers. A sacred month for a sacred month. Sacred things, too, are subject to retaliation. If anyone attacks you, attack him as he attacked you. So he listen to this over and over again. You know, anybody attacks you, slay him. Attack them that attack you. Fine. And then a few, a few uh, verses later, in verse 216, he says, Fighting is obligatory for you. And he's not talking about a spiritual warfare. He's talking about literal sword fighting. Go slay the wicked. Fighting is obligatory for you, much as you dislike it. But you may hate a thing, although it's good for you. And love a thing, although it's bad for you. God knows, but you know not. You don't, God knows you know not. Just shut up and fight because I said so and go slay these unbelievers until God's religion reigns supreme. Now, is this what Jesus taught? Did Jesus teach, attack those who attack you? No. If they attack you, slay them. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. Listen to what Christ taught. Verse uh, 19 of 1 Peter chapter 2. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. What does the Bible say? Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other off. Slay him! <laughs> he that smiteth you on the cheek, slay him now! <laughs> Don't do it in the mosque. Well, oh, if he hits you in the mosque, then do it in the mosque. Kill him in the mosque. <laughs> slay him wherever you find him. Slay him until God's religion reigns supreme. Hey, listen, God's religion's never going to reign supreme because narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that fight. Broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in there at. It's never going to be a thing where, hey, the whole world gets saved. No, most people are not saved. God's religion is never going to be supreme. It's the narrow way. But they're saying, hey, let's just slay the idolaters until God's religion reigns supreme. Now, this is not what the Bible teaches. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, in the Old Testament, it was kind of like that. You know, in the Old Testament, it was just slay everybody. No, it wasn't. In the Old Testament, it wasn't like that. Because it, where do you see in the Old Testament? Help me out with this. Where do you see in the Old Testament, hey, we just need to go around and just slay all these nations and force them to convert to worshiping the God of the Bible, all the surrounding nations? Where do you see that in the Bible? The only thing that you could point to is that God specifically told the children of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt to go into Canaan and wipe out those specific nations of the Canaanites who were cursed by God, who committed the filthiest imaginable acts. And he said, because they've done all these things, you need to just wipe these people out. You can't even coexist with these people because they've practiced so much filth and perversion and Leviticus 18 and 20 lists all the perversion that they did and it's horrific and it says hey they did all this that you need to go in there and wipe them out okay God never said hey convert the whole world through warfare through the sword and he didn't even say to convert those to force convert those people all he said to do was that these people have become so deviant and perverted that they need to be wiped out a specific nation but then once the children of Israel come in and inherit the land where do you see them going out and just conquesting and building an empire? I mean, where do you see 
an Israelite empire going, out, going into Europe, going into Africa, going into India, and just taking over and saying, convert to worshiping the Lord or we will slay you. There's nothing like that in either Old Testament or New Testament. That is false. So to sit there and say that that's anything, but here's the thing, even if that were in the, New Test in the Old Testament, which it's not, we're in the New Testament. And that's nothing that anywhere Christ said that we are to go to physical war in the New Testament. Show me in the New Testament where we're supposed to physically go out and fight against the Lord's enemies physically. Never, never is that taught. The only thing the Bible teaches in the New Testament is that government should punish evildoers. That's it. But never does it say, hey, we're going to go on jihad. We're going to go out and have a righteous warfare to, to, to convert people and force them under the, until we can just kind of take over as many places as possible and bring them to the true religion. No, the Bible doesn't teach attack those who attack you. The Bible doesn't say slay the idolaters. No, it says recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, slay him. No, it says, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what the Bible says. Totally opposite of what the Quran is saying. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, back to a little bit of the history of Muhammad. So Muhammad goes into the cave. He starts getting these visions starting at age 40. He starts reciting the Quran to some followers and he starts building up a following where he's reciting these surahs or chapters of the Quran and people start to believe in it and they start following his teachings. Well, here's the thing. He begins to be persecuted in his hometown, which is Mecca. And so eventually the Muslims in Mecca, they're persecuted and they end up leaving Mecca. They end up fleeing Mecca and going to a place called Medina. And in Medina is where all the followers of Muhammad begin to congregate and assemble. And so Medina becomes a very Muslim place. Okay. So then the Muslims in Medina, here's what they decide that they're going to do. Because of course, God reveals this to Muhammad that they're going to start raiding the caravans of Mecca. Now, what does it mean to raid a caravan? That means that here are caravans of people who are doing business, making money, right? Working, that's what people do. You know, they're trading, they're bringing merchandise from afar. They're going to swoop down and attack them and steal their stuff. Now, what does the Bible teach to steal? Well, as long as they're not saved, right? We can steal from them. That's not what the Bible, the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. But, but basically, Muhammad says, oh, you know, God wants us to raid these caravans and steal from the people from Mecca. Because they're a bunch of infidels anyway. So we'll rob them and fight them and kill them and whatever. I mean, this is not anything to do with the religion of the Bible, Old or New Testament. This is not Christianity. This is just a prophet who basically is teaching either the doctrines of devils, which is the most likely explanation, or just of his own wicked imagination and heart. Because if you think about it, you know, the same angel that's telling him, hey, marry a six-year-old, is the same one that, hey, raid caravans, hey, steal, kill, fight, do all this. It's not, it's, it's wickedness mm -hmm. that he's being spurred onto by these demons that are talking to him. So he begins to raid the caravans and then eventually there's a big battle where, you know, Mecca versus Medina and all this and blah, blah. You know, eventually they took control of Mecca once again and they got control of the GameCube, which I want to speak about for just a moment. The Kaaba is what they call it. Now, the Kaaba is this great giant cube. Now, they claim that this is a house of God, that this is a holy shrine that was built originally by Abraham and Ishmael. They built this thing to be the house of God. But here's what's interesting about the Kaaba. The Kaaba already existed before Muhammad came along, okay? And it was a thing that the pagan polytheistic Arabs used to worship their gods. So they had all these idols and false gods in the Kaaba. 
So Mohammed comes along and he just wants to basically take this over and make it a holy place. So he just says, oh, well, you know, get rid of all the idols, but this is a holy place still. And all throughout the Quran, he's, he's basically adopting and keeping all these traditions of the wicked pagan Arabs and claiming, oh, yeah, this is actually from God. It's just they messed it up. So the, the GameCube was originally a pagan Arab shrine to their false gods. He comes along and claims, oh, yeah, this is built by Abraham and Ishmael. Listen to what he says. Abraham and Ishmael laid the foundations of the... This is from the cow, verse 128. Abraham and Ishmael laid the foundations of the house and dedicated it, saying, accept this from us, Lord. You are the one that hears all and knows all. Lord, make us submissive to you. Make of our descendants a community that will submit to you. Teach us our rights of worship. Now, where is any of this in Genesis is what I'd like to know. Where in the Bible do we see Abraham and Ishmael building this cube? This is all just made up, and it's not confirming anything in the Bible. It's just completely made up. And also, he's saying in here, Safa and Marwa are two of God's beacons. These are mountains that the pagans would worship, these mountains. He's like, oh, well, you know, those are, it's okay to reverence them because those are just God's beacons. Just don't, don't say they're about false gods. So he's adopting all the pagan practices and everything. So when they make their pilgrimage to Mecca, you know, Islam teaches that, that one of the five pillars, they're supposed to make the pilgrimage to Mecca once in their lifetime at a minimum if they can. And that's what they do. They all bow down to that cube. They make circles around it. And they perform all these rituals about that cube. The game cube, as I affectionately call it. So, see how much time I got left here. I got to wrap this up here. But go, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's see what the Bible says about false prophets. Because that's what Muhammad is. He's a false prophet. Look at 2 Peter Chapter number two, you say, well, what's the evidence that he's a false prophet? Well, the fact that he contradicts everything that's taught in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. Contradicts the law of Moses repeatedly. Also, just to jump forward to the very end of this book, one of the very last things it says at the very end of this book, and it says it throughout the book, God is one, the eternal God. He begot none, nor was he begotten, and none is equal to him. Over and over again, it says, God has no son. God begets no one. And they say, well, Jesus was born of a virgin, but, but they say, you know, there was just no father. So instead of God being his father, there's just no father. Just born of one person. That doesn't make any sense. That's contrary to what the, the word of God teaches, of course. But look what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 about false prophets. It says in verses 1 and 2, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And of course, he denies that Jesus is the Son of God. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look at verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls... On heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Look, these descriptions fit Muhammad. Covetous practices like raiding caravans and stealing stuff. Yeah. Like coveting other men's wives. And marrying woman after woman after woman after woman. Because you have eyes that cannot be satisfied. Right. Why do you have to marry 11 wives? Because you're not content with such things as you have. And because you're not content and rejoicing with the wife of your youth. Not her youth, your youth, buddy. All right? So, you know, this, this fits Muhammad. Go to Jude. Jude, the parallel passage, a few pages later, where he talks about false prophets. Verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 
Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Look, Mohammed dreamed that he was supposed to marry a six-year-old. If he's not a filthy dreamer, I don't know what to say. Yeah. And it says he's going after strange flesh. Look, ch children is strange flesh. That's strange for a man to go after the flesh of children. Yeah. He's described as a false prophet. Muslims need to understand that according to the New Testament, which is a greater book than the Quran could even think of, there's more greatness in one chapter of the New Testament yeah. than in this whole book. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ provides a ransom, salvation, intercession, good news. Amen. Yeah. The Quran offers none of these things. And if you believe in the Bible, it's describing Muhammad as a false prophet. Yeah. It's describing him to a T. One more thing I want to cover, just so that I can kind of cover everything from the cow chapter that I wanted to cover. Because it actually brings up Jesus and Mary in the cow chapter. Now I have to find the part. I thought it was in my notes, but somehow it might not have made it in here. So just give me one second to find it here. I've got a lot of different things going on here. Find it. I mean, the cow chapter is not that long, and it's in here somewhere. So just give me a second. Got it all marked up. Okay, I'm sorry. We're spilling over into the next chapter. The house of Imran. This is actually in chapter 3 of the Quran. Look, it's 114 chapters. This is the second one we're looking at. And we've already seen a lot of lies and heresy, haven't we? Well, the house of Imran, Imran is, I-M-R-A-N, is referring to Amram. Okay? Now, if you know your Bible, you know that Amram was the father of who? Remember Amram and Jochebed? Who were their children? Exactly, Moses. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, right? Those are the three children of Amram and Jochebed. Well, here's the thing. In Arabic, the name Mary is Miriam. It's the same as that character from the Old Testament. So they have the same name. We, we say in English, Miriam and Mary. But in Arabic, it's the same name. It'd be Miriam and Miriam. So because... Mohammed was illiterate. He just made the foolish mistake of throughout the Quran thinking that Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, was the same person as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, here's the problem with that. Those people lived close to 2,000 years apart. I mean, and here's the thing. Whatever you believe, whatever your religion, these are historical figures, folks. Yeah. Even an atheist will tell you that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. Okay. Anybody knows that Moses lived, you know, not quite 2,000, but almost 2,000 years before Jesus. We're talking people that are separated by many, many centuries. Because think about it. After Moses, you've got what? 400 years of the judges. They, they, they have 400 years under the judges. Then they have the kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. That's 120 years. Then you've got, you know, the time of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he leads the northern kingdom into sin, 390 years. So it's like 400 plus 120 plus 390. Then another 500 years. So, I mean, you're looking at a long period of time. This is a pretty stupid mistake to make, to mix up. Miriam, the sister of... I mean, this is like something that a small child would mix up. Where they think that a character from Exodus is a character from Matthew. Think about it. Exodus and Matthew. That's pretty far apart. Yeah. But because he was illiterate and because he was a false teacher, he makes this error. So this house of Imran is talking about, it's talking about Mary being born and it's talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus and it calls her... Mary, the, the daughter of Amram, because of the fact that they think that it's the same person. Now, a lot of people, and, and it says in the footnote at the bottom of the page, in the Quran, Amram is also the Virgin Mary's father, because it talks about, you know, how they're the same person. Now, 
some people will try to cover for this and say, oh, it's not really the same. It's just, they just both happen to be named Amram, but it's a different Amram, you know. But here's the proof that it's not. If you jump forward to, uh, let's see, chapter 19 of the Quran, around verse 27, it talks about how Mary goes out into the desert and basically comes back with a baby. You know, totally different than the Bible's teaching of, of, you know, the manger and, you know, no room in the inn and Joseph's there and all. Totally different story in the Quran, of course. But in the Quran, carrying the child, listen to this, carrying the child, she came to her people who said to her, Mary, you have indeed done a shameful deed. You know, because she leaves and comes back with a kid. No Joseph in this story. Just, you know, Mary leaves, goes out in the desert, comes back with a baby. Mary, you've indeed done a shameful deed, sister of Aaron. Your father, or sister of Aaron? So not only is it saying Amram's her dad, it's saying Aaron's her brother. Because he truly did mix up Miriam of the Old Testament and Miriam of the New Testament. Because in Arabic, it's the same name. There's a footnote at the bottom of the page here in this edition of the Quran, it appears that Miriam, Aaron's sister, and Miriam, mother of Jesus, were, according to the Quran, one and the same person. <laughs> well, that's amazing that they lived so many hundreds and hundreds of years apart that they could be the same person. But when you're illiterate and you can't read the Bible, you're going to make mistakes like that when you're just going on hearsay of a vague knowledge of the Bible. Yep. Sister of Aaron! Your father was never a whoremonger, nor was your mother a harlot. She made a sign to them pointing to the child because she can't talk. She's been struck with dumbness. So she's pointing to the baby. But they replied, how can we speak with a babe in the cradle? We can't talk to this baby. Why are you pointing to the baby? Whereupon he, the baby, spoke and said, so this is the newborn baby Jesus. I am the servant of God. Okay, bring Boaz up here. I need a visual aid. Where's Boaz? Where, where's baby Boaz? Is he in the mother baby room? Oh, he's in the extra saucer. All right, bring, bring baby Boaz. Now, this isn't really a good illustration because, you know, this is at least... I, I need... Does somebody want to loan me a small baby? No, you know, this is the youngest kid I've got, folks. You know. So I, I just need a visual aid here. You know, but, but you know, in, in, the, in the Quran, it's a newborn. Okay? So here's what's going on in the Quran. I am the servant of God. He has given me the book and ordained me a prophet. His blessing is upon me wherever I go. And he has exhorted me to be steadfast in prayer and to give alms as long as I shall live. He has exhorted me to honor my mother and has purged me of vanity and wickedness. Peace be on me on the day I was born and on the day of my death and on the day I shall be raised to life. All right, so I just wanted to make it a little more real to you. Come get him. Come get him, Miriam. Oh, I wonder. Oh, your name's Miriam? You, I read about you in Exodus. You're in Matthew, too. Same Miriam, right? I mean, look, saying that, saying that the Miriam of Exodus is the Miriam of Jesus' mother is like saying that this is the same Miriam. That, I mean, the time frame of just being many hundreds and hundreds of years later, it's a similar mistake. Here's your baby, Miriam, all right? Go back to the desert. <laughs> Folks, this book was written by an illiterate false prophet who taught false doctrine according to his own lust. Yeah. Hey, let's raid caravans and kill people and take over Arabia. Who got a bunch of power for himself, amassed a following. Maybe it was because he wanted to have 11 wives and be bowed down to uh, as, oh, the greatest prophet of all time. Greater than Jesus. No, there's no one greater than Jesus because Amen. Jesus is the name above all names. Amen. But this man was a false prophet who got, who got his teachings from demons 
or from his own heart, but I believe it's from demons. Because, right. you know, when you got 1.6 billion followers, you need the devil's help for that. Yeah. I don't think he could do that on his own. Wickedness. Filth. Yeah. Pedophilia. Yeah. Blasphemy against Jesus. Right. A wicked... And listen, a wicked religion that was violent from the beginning. I mean, I read you the, the verses just in the very beginning of the Quran. I mean, there's more later in the Quran, of course. Right at the beginning, it's, hey, let's raid caravans. Let's go fight. Let's go slay. He told them, I bring you slaughter. He told them that before any of the fighting had even broken out. Man of Mecca, I bring you slaughter. Slay them all. Now you say, what's the purpose of the sermon? Well, because of the fact that today we're living in a day of ecumenicalism where people are trying to say, hey, Christianity and Islam aren't that different. You know, the Rick Warrens of this world, when they're not holding hands with Elton John, are basically saying, hey, you know, let's, let's focus on what we have in common with Islam. No, we need to make a clear distinction between us. That we have nothing to do with Islam. Right, amen. Islam is a wicked religion. But let me say this. I do not hate Muslims at all. In fact, I love Muslims and want them to be saved. Now, do I hate Muhammad? Yes. Do I hate the Quran? Yes. But I do not hate Muslim people at all. Now, listen, many Christians do hate Muslims, and they are wrong. And I love Muslims, and anytime I meet Muslims, I am kind to them. And you know what? I don't just walk up to them and say, what in the world do you believe in? I bought a copy of this book. It's the stupidest thing I've ever read. I mean, if I said that, that'd be the truth. It's not, this book is nonsense. But that's not what I say to them. You know, I, I give them the gospel. I, I, I start quoting the Bible and showing them scripture. And but look, I'm going to tell them that it's a false religion, though. But within the four walls of Faithful Word Baptist Church, I'm going to let him be accursed. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and sh be shy away from it. No. And it, now, look, I've heard about people, for example, there was a guy recently in Tempe, even. He went to some mosque in Tempe and was standing out there bullhorning and tearing up the Quran. Look, don't tear up the Quran, folks. Why would you tear up the most damning evidence against Islam? Yeah. Why would you tear it up? Why would you burn it? No, it is the biggest proof that the Quran, that, that Muhammad and Islam are a fraud. It's lies. See, we don't have to go out and kill people to get them to convert to Jesus because what we believe actually has power. Right. It's the gospel of Jesus. You know what we need to do with Muslims is not just go out there. See, I, don't, I, just, I, I question the motive of somebody who just goes over there and is just tearing up the Quran and bullhorning and, and whatever. Because at that point, it just becomes obnoxious and it's not, it's not really geared toward getting Muslims saved at that point. Yeah. Now you say, well, this sermon's not geared toward getting Muslims saved. Oh, how many Muslims do we have in the auditorium today? Zero. So let me ask you something. If we have zero Muslims in the auditorium today, why would I gear my sermon toward getting Muslims saved? Can somebody explain that to me? Wouldn't that be kind of a wasted sermon since there are no Muslims here? No, I'm preaching to Christians. I'm preaching to the saved so that you can understand the certainty of what we believe and the falsehood of what they believe. I'm, I'm teaching the saved. Plus, I was able to teach you some important doctrine from Deuteronomy, from 1 Corinthians, from Matthew, from Isaiah. You learned the truth tonight about intercession, about Jesus as a ransom, about divorce, what the Bible says about, you know, how old someone has to be before they can get married and so forth. But we need to understand that the Muslims today do not worship the same God because if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Right. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. They worship another God. They believe another gospel. And the motive tonight is not to get you all fired up and stirred up against Islam. And you're going to, you know, you hate these. No, we love the Muslims. And you know what? I hope that after hearing this sermon tonight, your desire 
is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ unto Muslims. And you know, if you walk out of here just without that desire, then you're not right with God. Yeah. If you walk out of here just, yeah, nuke them, kill them, yeah, burn them, yeah, then you know what? You're not right with God tonight. Right. Because you ought to have love for the lost. Yeah. Now the Bible says here, or not the Bible, the Quran says, right at the beginning of this Imran chapter, God does not love the unbelievers. Now, is that what the Bible teaches? No, the Bible says God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. But this says, you know, uh, God does not love the unbelievers. But here's the thing. We as Christians shouldn't have the attitude of this book of kill them all. God doesn't love them. No, God loves them. We need to get them saved. We need to love them and bring them the gospel. And you know what? I can honestly say I've had several Muslims. I have won an Iranian Muslim unto Christ. You know, and those are the ones that are seen as, hey, the radical, you know, the, the ones from Iran. You know, I won an Iranian Muslim. I've, run, I've won other Muslims to the Lord over the years. Thank God Muslims are usually pretty receptive to at least listening to the gospel. Muslims are pretty receptive. If you go out soul winning a lot and you run into Muslims, they'll usually listen to the gospel. We need to take the opportunity, the mission fields all around us here, to get these Muslims the gospel of Jesus Christ and to tell them about the intercessor. Tell them about the ransom for their soul. Tell them about Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and rose again according to the scripture that they might be saved by faith. Now, you say, well, Pastor Anderson... You know, you don't preach against Islam a lot. You know, first of all, I have done sermons against Islam. I did a sermon called Mormonism and Islam where I showed that Mormonism is a white man's Islam. Same doctrine. Same religion. But secondly, you know, sometimes I find myself not really desiring to preach against Islam just because of the fact that I know that right now there's a propaganda campaign going on to demonize Muslims for the benefit of the military industrial complex, that we might go to war and slaughter Muslims and to basically dehumanize and demonize the enemy. And listen, I want nothing to do with that. I don't want anything to do with that. My goal is to peacefully preach the good news of Jesus Christ unto Muslims. That is my only goal. I don't want to see any of them slain. I don't want to just get in their face and scream at them and tell them what I think, that's not the goal. You know, the goal is to win them to Christ. And you say, how are we going to do it? Through this sermon? No. This sermon's for the saved. Here's how we're going to do it, by going out and knocking their door. Amen. And showing them what the Bible says about the gospel. That's the game plan for getting Muslims saved. Show them the gospel of Jesus from the Bible. And you know, this attitude that hates them and wants them dead and wants them nuked and wants them killed or, or says that they're all wicked, they're all wicked, they're all horrible. No, they're not. Who here has known some Muslim people in your personal life? You, me too. And you know what? They were nice people. It's not their fault in many cases that they've been brought up and deceived and are ignorant. And they're taught this from, the, from birth or whatever. Now, I'm sure that many of them are wicked people. Don't get me wrong. There are evil Muslims that are violent and want to kill everybody. And, and there are a, a lot of the, you know, mullahs and their religious teachers that are pedophiles and that are homosexuals in the closet. There are all kinds of demonic, wicked people in the Muslim religion. But you know what? Your average Muslim, just like your average Catholic, just like your average agnostic, just like your average whatever, is this a nice person who basically is following this because that's what they were taught and they're waiting for you to bring them the gospel. Yeah. So I, I don't want my sermon to be misconstrued any way where I'm lumped in with this hatred for and demonization of Muslims as a whole because I don't believe in it. I love Arabic people, Persian people, Indonesian people. You know, I want them saved. No hatred in my heart toward them at all. I only hate those who hate the Lord, those who are reprobate. Yeah. And that's a minority. Out of 1.6 billion Muslims, they're not all horrible people. And so we need to get them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to speak the truth in love and not uh, demonize them as, as less than human or barbaric. People, people just say stupid things. Like somebody said, 
The Arabs, they showed a picture of the Arabs and they said that they've given nothing to the world. No, nothing to the world for the last, you know, 1,300 years or whatever. But even the number 1,300 was written in Arabic numbers. Because even our numbers, 1, 3, 0, 0, did you know those are Arabic numerals? Who knew that those are called Arabic numerals? Yeah, because that's opposed to what? Roman numerals. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we don't write things like M, C, X, X, V, I. It's a pain. Thank you, Arabs, for giving us. But it wasn't Islam who gave us those numerals. Okay, so you got to be able to differentiate between the people and the religion. It's not a, it's not a racial thing. Ah, these Arabs! No, it's not the Arabs that are the problem. It's Islam that's the problem. So d don't sit there and just make stupid comments like, oh, the Arabs never... They invented lots of stuff. They made lots of scientific discoveries through the years and so on and so forth. So it's not about the race. It's not about the nation. It's about the religion. And Muhammad's a false prophet. Piss be upon him. Let's bow our never word of prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And we thank you so much for the gospel that it really is glad tidings, Lord. Please help us to get it out to all the people who are lost in this world, Lord. Help us to give it to the Muslims, Lord. They, they live in Tempe. They live in Phoenix. Help us to knock their door and find them and, and preach them the gospel with love in our hearts, with a tear in the eye, with the Bible in our hand, Lord. Help us to reach the Hindus, the Buddhists, the, the, the false apostate Christians, Lord. Help us to reach the Catholics. The Catholics, Lord, are just as unsaved as the Muslims tonight. Help us to get the, the saving gospel of Jesus unto all the lost not to have a, a, just slaughter and hatred and violence in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's sing a song before we go. All right, we broke the record. What do we have tonight? 140. Wow, so we have 140 people here tonight. What was our old Sunday night record? 125. So we broke, we smashed the record. So that means we have ice cream for everybody after the service. Every time we break the record, we get ice cream. So stick around for ice cream. And we also have a baptism after the service tonight. Thank you.